In this video, we're going to learn about kinetics and equilibrium. Uh, kinetics is the study of what affects the rates of chemical reactions, and chemical equilibrium looks at how reactions are reversible and how the relative rates of the forward and reverse reaction control what position that equilibrium will lie at. So the first thing in chemical kinetics we have to understand is what is a reaction rate? What do we mean by a reaction rate? And that means how fast the concentration of the reactants and products is changing. So if we look at the lab that you designed, um, let's say you could look at how fast the Tums was disappearing. And you could look at how, like, how many grams of Tums were left after a certain amount of time. So maybe like every 15 seconds you could pull the Tums out and remass it and you could get... Um, a mass of it there. Or if you look at the rate of carbon dioxide uh, produced, so you can trap that gas and look at how fast the gas was coming off, and you could measure the reaction rate that way. Um, so think about reaction rate. The reaction rate is not going to be directly related to the balanced chemical reaction, so uh, we'll learn what it is related to in a minute here. Uh, you can sometimes determine what the reaction rate, like how it relates to what's happening if you understand what's called a reaction mechanism, which again we'll talk to about in a minute. And uh, oftentimes the reaction rate and how it relates to the concentrations of things has to be determined experimentally. So going into some of those terms I mentioned, a reaction mechanism is a series of steps that a chemical reaction takes to uh, in order uh, to react. So reactions aren't just like we start with some molecules and we end with some different molecules. There's a whole slew of steps that usually happen uh, in the meantime. Okay, And so here, for example, is a reaction mechanism that illustrates how you can go with from what's called a cis conformation of uh, something where you've got your two groups on the same side of a double bond and in the end um, that is goes into what's called a trans configuration where your two groups are on opposite sides of the double bond and when we learn to talk more about um, organic chemistry later on we'll look at well, why is that important or, or is, does that matter so you can see that doesn't just they, you can't just make them flip okay so I could say that um, this iodine radical plus the cis conformation goes to that plus an iodine radical, or even just that this can become that going directly from one to the other, but it has to happen in steps, okay? So the thing about a reaction mechanism is that uh, reaction mechanisms have multiple steps, and in each step something is usually either breaking apart into two different things, or we have two things coming together into one. So if we look at this reaction mechanism here, this first step is two things coming together, and then actually this step is just the uh, one thing changing its arrangement, so it's just rotating, so it's a, probably be a very fast step. And then uh, here, we just have it falling back apart, okay? Now, when we look at what's going to determine how fast a reaction goes, it's going to be dependent on whatever the slowest step of the process is. Okay, And I always make the analogy of when I'm putting, let's say I was putting together a mailing, like I have to mail letters out to hundreds of people. Well, if I break that into steps, if I already, let's say I already have all the letters printed, I got the envelopes, I might have to fold the paper, I'm going to have to stuff the paper into the envelope, I'm going to have to put a stamp on it, Okay, and I'm going to have to address it. Now what determines the rate of my reaction is going to depend on what's my slowest step. Let's say I have to handwrite the addresses. Well, so if it takes me like one minute to address the um, envelopes, then if I have 100 envelopes to do, it's going to take me 100 minutes to get this done. It doesn't matter that folding it maybe takes 10 seconds and stuffing it takes 5 seconds and putting a stamp on it takes 1 second. When you look at it, when I'm all said and done, maybe it actually takes me 100 minutes and 16 seconds. But the fact that it takes 1 minute to address that, okay, 
Now that's going to be the rate determining step. Now let's say if I had pre-made addresses, so now it only takes me just five seconds to address instead of one minute. That no longer becomes my rate determining steps and now my reaction is going to go much faster because now it's going to be dependent on the fact that it takes 10 seconds to fold it. Okay, so as soon as I get one folded, let's say if I have it lined up with, with like one person doing each thing, and that's one thing I forgot to mention before, as soon as I have it folded, boom, it's going to get stuffed, it's going to get stamped, it's going to get an address put on it. Whereas if the rate determining step comes later in the process, stuff builds up, and then the rate determining step slowly reacts it away. But it's always the time it takes to do that rate determining step that's going to determine how long it takes to do everything else. Okay. Once we look at rate, we can, once we've done experiments or sometimes from our mechanisms, which we won't really get into in this class, but when we've done experiments, we can come up with a rate law. And a rate law just tells us how fast should that reaction go based on how much, what the concentration is of our different species present. Okay? So when we look at that rate law, um, the K means is a, is a constant that's depending on temperature which again is experimentally determined. When I have square brackets around something, so these square brackets around A and B means concentration of them. The X and the Y are, ex are exponents, okay? So they tell us to what order does the reaction rate depend on something, okay? So for example, if I look at my data here, if I have a reaction between the phosphate ion and hydrogen, okay? If I look at my first experiment, the rate for if I use 0.1 molar of PO3 and 0.1 molar of hydrogen, my reaction rate was 1.5, um, and that would be like in molarity per second. Okay, so but either the products or the reactant, something changed by 1.5 molarity per second. Okay, now when I doubled, so you can see going from here to here, I took my <coughs> amount of PO3 and I multiplied by two. And then going from here to here, this also is times 2. So when I write my rate law, now I know that it's equal to some constant times PO3 to the first power. Because when I double PO3, the rate also doubles. Okay. So now if I compare that now, if I look at comparing experiment 1 to experiment 3, when I go from here to here, I took my hydrogen times 2. But now when I go from 1 to 3, 1 1.5 to 6 is a multiplied by 4 change. So doubling the hydrogen caused the rate to quadruple. So I know that hydrogen then is a squared order, or second order, because I have to square what I do to hydrogen to look at what the change of the rate is, because doubling squared is, is multiplying by 4. Okay. So why do, why do molecules react and why does the rate do what it does? That goes to collision theory, okay? So the thing about collision theory is molecules have to collide to react. There's no way to react molecules if they don't actually collide. So if you look, if we could see down into like our beakers when we're reacting things together, we would see the molecules are sipping all over the place and vibrating back and forth and bumping into each other. And that bumping into each other happens very often. So like 10 billion times every second, each molecule is colliding with another molecule. However, only a few collisions are actually going to be what are called effective. So we look at this diagram here. If we look at this reaction between like, this may be supposed to be like hydrochloric acid and ethylene. If they collide just right, if this hydrogen comes right in and smacks straight into that double bond, that's good. That collision will happen and will lead to a change in those molecules. If the chlorine bumps in, nothing. Nothing's going to happen there. Or if the chlorine bumps into the side of the carbon atom, nothing's going to happen. If the two hydrogens bump into each other, nothing's going to happen. So it has to be hit just right. Okay. So you might see that that doesn't seem like very good odds, but if you consider we've got 10 to the 23 molecules, okay, and each one of them is having 10 to the 10th um, collisions per second. Okay, even so that's a total like every second then you're having 10 to the 33rd collisions 
even if only one in 13 collisions is effective, you're still having like a large number, okay? So we've got 30, 10 to the 33rd, let's actually say what the number is, divided by 10 to the 13th. So you still have 10 to the 20th collisions that are effective, okay? Every second, all right? And so, and again, these numbers are rough and, and depending on the reaction, some things are easier as we'll see than others to make this happen. But you're still, you know, it might seem like 1 in 10 to 13, those are really bad odds. But you got so many players that somebody is going to win, or actually quite a few somebody's are going to win every second. Okay? Um, when we look at energy and reactions, it's kind of to draw in what we learned about thermodynamics. Okay? And we'll, we'll talk about this too, is that energy always has to be added to make a reaction happen. So every time something collides... There's some energy that's being put in, and you do get some energy back out. And we kind of talked about that earlier in terms of the bonds breaking, bonds being formed. Um, and that energy that gets put in to start it out, that's called the activation energy. So the amount of, to get up on top of this hill is the activation So you think about like when you light a match, like matches burn just fine once they're lit, but you have to strike it first. The energy you put in striking that match, that is the activation energy that gets that going. And so some reactions, even though they're very favorable reactions, um, like for example, the thermite reaction, even though that's super favorable and it, it really in some ways would like to go, it has a huge activation energy too. So it usually doesn't just happen on its own. Okay, so and that's pretty common too. And there's other reactions that we can uh, look at some examples, hopefully in class as well. Okay, so there's some different factors that affect rate, and so they're here for you. I've already written them out, so you've got them there right in front of you. I want to look at some pictures to kind of like explain these. So nature of reactants. What type of reactants are we dealing with? And so I'm talking about nature reactants. To kind of compare these two pictures here. Which one of these two are you fighting in terms of how fast are you going to get knocked out? Okay, so some reactants are very strong reactants and they just cause by their nature fast reactions to happen. Some reactants are very weak and so they don't, the reactions don't happen very quickly just because they're, and it could be maybe because of weak, you know, because they have to hit just right or because there's lots of bonds that have to be rearranged to make it happen, okay? So that, just the nature of reactants, some reactions happen very fast and some happen very slow. Most reactions we do in high school chemistry are very fast. Um, most reactions that you do in like college take a long time. So like college chemistry labs have to be very um, long sometimes. Temperature. Temperature, remember, has to do with how fast molecules are moving. So think about the the higher the temperature, the faster the molecules are moving, so the more often they collide. So here we got this guy up here with fists of fury just going back and forth like super fast. Okay, that's going to lead to a faster knockout. All right. Concentration. If there's more things around hinges, so let's say if you're boxing this guy, and I think this, I'm sure this god or goddess is very peaceful by nature, but he's got tons of arms. So it's easy if he or she is able to like smack at you constantly with all these different arms, you're gonna get knocked out a lot faster. That's concentration. Um, surface area, kind of like backwards thinking, but you know, cause obviously you hit these big foam hands. Um, it's not gonna knock you out very quickly cause uh, less pressure. But in terms of chemical reactions, if you have more surface area, then you're more likely to make contact um, with the two things. And surface area is important when you have what are called heterogeneous uh, mixtures that are reacting. So like maybe one thing's in the gas form, one's in the liquid. So the amount of surface that acts between them um, becomes really important then because they can only react where they collide and they only collide at the surfaces. And then catalysts are things that don't actually get used up in the reaction, but they make a faster and easier path for the reaction to take place. And so my, um, my analogy here is brass knuckles. Okay. Uh, so equilibrium then. Equilibrium is a state that occurs when you have two competing reactions. Whoops. So you have two competing reactions and when those two competing reactions have the same rate, okay, we've said to reach equilibrium. So we're going to do this. You'll have done this in equilibrium red rover in class where people go back and forth, okay, and you look at 
eventually get to a point where there's no more change. Even though there's still people going back and forth, even though there's reactions still happening, on the grand scheme, you're not going to see a change in, in how people behave. Okay? Uh, so, the position of a reaction at equilibrium can be related by a, a fairly simple um, formula, which is illustrated here. So this is kind of like, these are just in generic terms. If I was looking at an actual reaction, so let's say um, I've got hydrogen plus chlorine goes to 2HCl, I would find that at equilibrium, if I plugged, no matter what I started with, no matter how much hydrogen, how much chlorine I started with, and equilibrium, sorry, I should write with double arrows, and I was looking at how much hydrochloric acid is made and how much hydrogen chlorine are left over, no matter what numbers I started with, when I plugged them in, if I took those values and put them into this ex expression, I would always get the same number. So we'll be doing a lab with that where we look at um, before and after concentrations and plugging them in and seeing that they do, in fact, um, always are equaling out to the same value. Okay? What I really want you guys to understand at this level of chemistry is Le Chatelier's principle, which basically states if I do something to a reaction, if the reaction is already at equilibrium when I do something to it, it will counteract what I did. It will cause a change to, um, to go in the opposite way. And it's not that reactions at equilibrium are, are like recalcitrant or stubborn and they're like, well, fine. If you're going to lower the amount of hydrogen that's around, I don't like that. I'm just going to raise it back up. Okay? It's just that if I lower the amount of hydrogen in that last reaction, then the reaction that takes away hydrogen will slow down. And so the reaction that puts it back is now faster, even though they were at the same rate. Okay? So again, it's just that by you changing something about a system at equilibrium, you're changing the rates that were equal, and now they're not equal anymore. So something's going to happen until the rates are equal again. So there's nothing magical. There's nothing about the, the reaction making these decisions. It's just because you're shifting the rates around. All right? That's all there is for these notes.